Uh, I'm delighted to introduce um, Soma, who I've, I've known for more than a year now, um, and she is a bi fellow with us. Um, she completed her MD PhD at Cambridge, um, was a Lucy Anna Fitzwilliam student, received membership in the um, Royal College of P Physicians in the UK before moving to the US for an internship in medicine there. Um, she's board certified in neurology and neurooncology and was recently elected FRCP. Um, Dr. Sengupta was an attending at the Beth Israel Deaconess um, Medical Center at Harvard. I am so old, I did not even know they'd merged um, in neurooncology before moving to Emory University and the Winship Cancer Institute. She's got a long standing research interest in membrane transport proteins. And a major part of her laboratory's research is studying such proteins as anti-cancer targets. Clinically, um, Dr. Singupta, who was actually on the phone clinically when I uh, met her just a few minutes ago, manages adult brain tumors and adult survivors of pediatric brain cancers. The title of the talk tonight is Out with the New, In with the Old, an old class of drugs with new tricks in cancer. Thank you very much, Soma, for doing this, and over to you. It's an honor, um, uh, Jane and um, Lucy Cavendish College community, and um, whoever is tuning in, to be part of Connections today. And um, I am honored to sort of give a talk about the topic that Jane mentioned, and um, we shall start um, going through the talk. Okay, so if we um, proceed with the next slide. Um, I would like to declare my disclosures before I start. Um, I have consulted for Novacure and I'm the co-founder of Amlal Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Um, forward, please. As with any research, um, funds are usually from philanthropy and from the cancer research institutes. So in my case, I have been really blessed to be um, funded by the Harold C. Schott Endowment, the Pam and Tom Michelle Foundation, Schiff Family Funds, the NIH, namely the NCI and NINDS, Melanoma Research Funds, Winship Cancer Institute, B. Cured Foundation for Brain Cancer Research, and as always, we can't do research without the encouragement of family and friends. So proceeding on from here. So the learning outcomes that I want you to focus on today is um, the GABA A neurotransmitter receptor and its implication in cancer. And not all cancer agents need to work by cell signaling. Next slide. So, if you take a look at the slide, um, you can see that it looks quite complex, um, but I want you to focus in on that red box right there. So this is what we call a chemical synapse, and it's like an electrical communication between neurons. So that's the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron. What do I mean by neurons? So these are nerve cells that cross talk to one each, uh, um, each other in, in the nervous system. And of course the brain is part of that nervous system as our nerves. And now what's interesting about that is that there are all these unusual proteins, whether they're on the presynaptic side and postsynaptic side. And these are like shuttles, if you like, shuttling compounds in and out. And in this case, it's neurotransmitters that help this electrical and chemical communication between cells um, of the nervous system. And if we look more closely into the, in this red box, you can see that in the postsynaptic um, neuron, this green structure, that blob-like structure, which has a pore through it, these can be called channels. And some of these proteins are receptors. And so you might hear the interchangeable words of channels um, and receptors. Now to simplify this diagram, let's go to the middle figure, a figure. So the release of a neurotransmitter from a presynaptic neuron and the green uh, circular blob is the neurotransmitter. And this purple um, object 
is a ligand gated ion channel and it can be closed or open. So a bit like, you know, when you go into a busy building and there are those revolving doors, well, it's a bit like that. You know, you can rotate through, but you have to have a certain catalyst, if you like, to open the door. So those are people. So if you imagine there are the green um, neurotransmitters are bound to it, and this then opens the door, allowing these ions to flood through. Okay, next slide. The neurotransmitter receptor that I'm going to focus on is the GABA-A receptor, and it's a chloride channel. What does that actually mean? So basically, it's a receptor that binds a neurotransmitter called GABA. So these going back to these green circles, two GABAs are binding on, and when it it opens, it allows um, the transport of these yellow circles or chloride ions. But what's interesting about the GABA-A neurotransmitter receptor is that in embryonic development, it's an excitatory one. So it depolarizes cells um, following the binding of GABA. And what does this do actually? It, enables proliferation. What does that mean? So it stimulates cell growth, it stimulates cell movement, and then it helps stem cells to develop. And the formation of synapses is also hinging upon this process. And in adults, um, it's completely different. It's an in inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it hyperpolarizes cells following the binding of GABA. So if we look at the um, Su and Chang uh, figure, where they have the embryonic and the adult side, which is quite a complicated figure. But what I want you to see is that another transport protein or membrane protein called NKCC1, it's found in the embryo, but in adults, it's something different. And GABA as well is working differently, um, where it's excitatory in the embryo and inhibitory um, in the adult. And you can see the difference of the electrical activity in both. And I've simplified it um, to the right where you have the differences. So in an adult cell, um, where you have the GABA uh, A receptor, you can see that the chloride is going into the cell. Whereas in the embryonic cell, it goes out of the cell. So this in and out phenomenon is something that we need to remember for the subsequent slides. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what are the normal modulators of GABA receptors? So when I mean modulators, what things bind to it? There are a lot of natural compounds that are very interesting and have many properties. So um, I remember at Lucy, there's this beautiful uh, magnolia grandiflora plant. And these magnolias have a beautiful fragrance. And throughout um, the southern part of the United States and um, into Kentucky and areas um, within the US, you get them growing prolifically. And they have these huge flowers. But did you know that the flowers produce honochial? And honochial uh, binds to GABA, uh, the GABA receptor. And it has strong anti-cancer properties. And one of my colleagues um, called Jack Arbazar is actually studying the properties of honochial in cancer. alpha thujone is um, very interesting for those of you who are in the sort of um, humanities. So whether it's Oscar Wilde or the um, painters like Van Gogh and many others, well, I'm sure there's a list of them that love the absinthe fairy. And of course, absinthe comes from the plant wormwood. And what is um, wormwood? Well, it's a stimulant. It's a GABA antagonist. So it binds to the GABA receptor um, tightly. And it's been tried in conditions like attention deficit disorder and Alzheimer's. And maybe that's why um, Oscar Wilde and Van Gogh like the absinthe. It helped them focus in their work. Who knows? Um, picrotitoxin comes from the Indian berry, also stimulant. It's actually a very potent toxin um, and it was tried in um, schizophrenia. And so the world of plants does have a lot of 
natural um, compounds that could be used in the GABA receptors. Next slide. So Leo Sternbach, uh, he is the person credited with developing Valium, which belongs to the family of drugs called benzodiazepine. Um, I don't know about all of you, but lately I've been watching the Queen's Gambit, which was intriguing for me because this is a TV um, series uh, which focuses in Kentucky, actually, in Cincinnati, about a chess prodigy who grew up in an orphanage and she was given nothing, uh, none other than Valium to help her um, stay calm. And it shows throughout the TV show that um, the use of Valium was prolific during these times to keep women um, calm. And um, one can't sort of emphasize the import importance of this compound um, historically in a lot of things. Uh, it, women were given it to keep calm, not be neurotic, help them with their sleep. And of course it had addictive potential like the barbiturates before it, but not as strong as the barbiturates I'd say. So what do benzodiazepines do? So if you think about it, um, the neurotransmitter receptor, the GABA receptor can be closed, open or enhanced. So the open conformation, if you like, is what it does naturally. And when it's enhanced, it's when one of these benzodiazepines binds to a different site than GABA. But because the activity is still the, the ions going through in a particular direction, we call it activity enhanced. Um, next slide, please. So what was striking for me is GABA-A neurotransmitter receptors are found in um, lots of different cells in the body and in immune cells. And in cancers, you, you can see many cancers that have almost high levels of these receptors. And the question is, why are they there? So for example, if we turn to the brain, which is my topic of interest, um, glioblastomas, medulloblastomas, they have um, high levels of these receptors. Um, uh, we Part of my lab is working on lung cancer and we found it there in melanoma, which is not surprising that it's a neural crest. So in other words, nervous tissue derivative cancer that also has these receptors and it's been found in a number of other solid organ cancers. And what was really striking to me and I had not realized this is that CD8 T cells, uh, CD4, CD3, so these are all immune cells and all of these cells protect our bodies against infections, try to combat cancers. Well, all of these cells contain these receptors. Um, please progress. So can a benzodiazepine kill cancer cells by enhancing function? That would be novel, wouldn't it? Um, next slide. So I went back to the, so I like researching old, um, older papers and I read Kleinemann and Framani's paper. Um, uh, Joseph Framani is very well known for describing many cancer syndromes um, that are genetically inher inherited. And Ruth Kleinemann and he did a lot of research together. And they did this study in the 1980s where they took um, a thousand cases of breast cancer patients and they matched, they approximately matched them with the controls who were participants in a breast cancer screening program. And they wanted to see what their diazepam use was like. And the reason they, they did this is that they wanted to show that diazepam, which is Valium, uh, caused um, breast cancer progression. But in fact, um, it, it, it was not the case. Um, the sort of, the, study was actually intriguing because those with advanced breast cancer cases who were on diazepam actually did better. So this 
story came out in the 80s, but no one did anything with it. It was like, well, I'm not really sure why we see this. Let's just leave it alone. Next slide, please. So uh, my story starts around 2011, um, just before 2011, when I was working with um, Dr. Scott Pomeroy and colleagues at Boston Children's. And I looked at the paper uh, that they just published when I joined the laboratory. And Dr. Pomeroy said, have a look at this heat map. So what is a heat map? So let's go through this. So first of all, to the left, you have um, an idealized diagram of the brain. And this part here is the cerebellum and where you can see the black arrows projecting from. And in this area of the brain, a tumor called medulloblastoma, which is a primary brain cancer in that it originates from the brain, develops. And what they did was they took um, the patients, which are all the rows, um, and then the columns are the genes that are expressed. And if you look at the colors, the white is neutral, the red is high expression, and blue is low expression. And what does expression mean? So it's sequencing of all of these tumors to see what genes let up. And they found that when they did that with medulloblastoma, medulloblastoma was no longer a simple tumor. It was actually molecularly, it could be classified into various types of tumors. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but one molecular class was called WINT, which is a signaling pathway. Another one was called Sonic Hedgehog. And no, it's not the cartoon Sonic Hedgehog, but a signaling pathway Sonic Hedgehog. And then we have the group three, group four, and all of the sequencing was compared to normal post-mortem cerebellum. Now in group three, I noticed as Dr. Pomeroy rightly um, wanted me to take a look at, there were membrane proteins that were expressed highly. And in particular, the GABA receptor five, which I became very interested in. And why was I interested in group three? Well, it's one of the groups that has the worst prognosis in medulloblastoma. Next slide, please. So one of the studies that myself and my team did was we started to look at whether the GABA receptor could be found in the cancer cells. So we stained the cancer cells with an antibody that stained for the receptor and the blue, beautiful blue stain is the DAPI, which stains the nucleus. And we did merge um, confocal microscopy to look to see where the GABA receptor was. And it was staining beautifully throughout the cytoplasm and membranes. And what we also found was that the cancer cells um, did respond to GABA by electrical currents. So these receptors were functioning. And the tumor also responded to benzodiazepines, which was also striking. So we had functional receptors in these cancer cells, which was quite striking. Next page. So what I want to go back to is the diagrams that I've been going through at the beginning. So we look at the embryo, the chloride goes out. Look at the adult, the chloride goes into the cell. Look at the cancer cell. It's pushing the chloride out. So the cancer cell is behaving like the embryo. Next slide. So this is our theory as to how uh, we think the benzodiazepines may cause problems for the cancer cells. So basically you have a GABA binding and the chloride is pushed out, but when you put the benzodiazepine, and this is not, um, these are a new generation of benzodiazepines. It's not the classic Valium or the older class of drugs. 
that bind very nicely. And what happens is the activity of this is so enhanced that we push a lot of chloride out. And when we do that, the inside of the cell is depolarized and the mitochondria, which are powerhouses of the cell, do not like it. And they start um, undergoing fission and breaking down. And then P53, which is a tumor suppressive gene, which is trying to protect the cell, also starts going AWOL. So basically by just changing the way that the ions behave in the cell, we're changing the way that the cancer cell is able to respond and it kills the medulloblastoma cancer cells. Next slide. But can this work for a systemic cancer? So this was a question that Dr. Pomeroy posed. He said, that's great, you've got it to work in medulloblastoma, but does it do anything in any other cancer? So off I went to the drawing board to do some more work um, with my team. Next slide. So as I mentioned previously, melanoma um, is, from, is derived from nervous tissue. It's a neural crest tumor. And it affects primarily adults. Uh, many of you might remember Bob Marley, who was diagnosed when he was 31 years old with melanoma, and he died at the age of 36 with metastasis to his brain and lungs. And to the right, you can see um, an FDG PET scan where we look to see where the cancer spread is. And you can see all these black blobs everywhere, dark black blobs. And that's um, melanoma that's metastasized all over the body. So 2.3% um, of the US population will be diagnosed with this cancer. And in 2019, over a million were living with it. And brain metastasis occurs in approximately 50% of melanoma patients. And when we think of um, brain metastasis, we also call this a secondary brain tumor. In other words, it's a brain tumor that hasn't arisen from the brain itself, but has come, uh, has gotten there from elsewhere. Next slide, please. So this is looking at um, melanoma tumors from patients. Uh, and um, a colleague of mine at Emory uh, kindly gave us samples to sequence. And we could see that a whole gamut of GABA receptors were expressed highly in the various subtypes of melanomas that had metastasized to other parts of the body. Next, please. So the current therapies for metastatic melanoma involve radiation. Um, that's actually a modality used for a lot of cancers. Uh, in melanoma, melanoma tends to be radio resistant. So in other words, it, it's poorly effective. Uh, and radiation generally leads to secondary malignancies, and it's very challenging to treat diffuse metastatic disease. So where all the organs have some disease burden with radiation. Could you imagine radiating the person from head to toe? Not really. Targeted therapy. So um, signaling pathways have been fantastic in revealing um, different mutations. So for example, in melanoma, half of them have this mutation called BRAF, which is a type of signaling um, pathway. And these inhibitors called BRAF MEK inhibitors were developed. They work, but then patients develop resistance. Then immunotherapy, uh, which works by various mechanisms, but here um, we're talking about pd one and CTLA-4. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but what you need to, the take home point here is most patients do not exhibit a durable response. And it's about $150,000 a year per patient in the US. Next slide. So what we decided to do was to see whether our benzodiazepine of interest worked in a mouse model. Now, mouse models are a way that we look at drugs and test them. But in melanoma, we have a very nice system where there's a spontaneously occurring melanoma model. And this is called syngeneic. That means we can really look at the immune system in these mice. 
So what we did was day zero, we injected the cancer cells. Um, so it's the mouse melanoma cancer cells injected into the flanks of both mice. By day 10, the tumors were, we could feel the tumors. And then we injected the special benzodiazepine um, intraperitoneally. And we did that for seven days from day 10, when the tumors were palpable for a week. And then at day 25, we sacrificed the mice. Next slide, please. What was striking in melanoma, we found that the drug alone um, at 50 milligrams per kilogram and 25 milligrams per kilogram um, at non-sedating concentrations promoted reduction in tumor size. Now, the mouse to human conversion of drug is different because mice metabolize um, this drug much faster than people do. And so the dose required in people would be less than this. Next slide. But we could, we would never use benzodiazepine as a, a alone for treatment because of um, trying to have um, a synergy with the other modalities. So when you're treating a cancer, you, you try not to use one drug and the magic bullet approach um, doesn't seem to work. So we try to use multiple agents, multiple ways of getting at the disease. So we wanted to look to see whether the benzodiazepine could indeed be used with radiation and whether it could be used with immunotherapy. Next slide. So we added radiation into the mix with the mouse work. So again, we injected the melanoma mouse cancer cells into the flank. By day 10, we had the tumors. Um, we did the benzodiazepine injections from days 10 to 17, and we radiated the tumor once uh, with a dose of radiation that we normally use for this, this mouse model um, at day 17. And then at day 23, we sacrificed the mice. Next slide. This was quite something. So when you combine the benzodiazepine with radiation, if you look at the blue where there's no treatment and the green with the benzodiazepine alone at a low dose, so much lower than we used in the first experiment, and then we use that same low dose of benzodiazepine with um, radiation, the brown square, you can see that the tumors completely shrunk. Um, and the radiation alone doesn't have that effect. Next slide. So now if you combine benzodiazepine with radiation and immunotherapy, so the immunotherapy was given at the same dose um, days as the benzodiazepine this time, and um, basically the same kind of mouse experiment, but adding in the immunotherapy to the radiation mix. Next slide, please. You can see um, what happens. So the blue, there's no treatment, green, low dose of the benzodiazepine. Um, and if you do benzodiazepine, with um, a bit of radiation that works nicely. Um, if you do benzodiazepine with immunotherapy, it's kind of an intermediate effect. But if you, um, and if you do the immunotherapy with the um, radiation, it's very similar to the benzodiazepine and the radiation. And think of the cost of the benzodiazepine versus the immunotherapy here. And then when you combine all of them, well, the effect is pretty dramatic. Next slide. So the key points to take home from the slides so far are GABA receptors um, channels in cancer cells act like embryonic cell channels. Cancer cells can be impaired by the use of a drug that enhances activity. There's a potential to harness natural compounds for cancer treatments. And um, this has been done by many medical practices, including Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, amongst others, and drugs like vincristin, which comes from um, the Madagascan periwinkle, and um, taxanes that come from the yew tree um, are examples of this. Benzodiazepines can potentially be used with radiation and immunotherapy so that you can reduce the doses of the radiation and immunotherapy. 
And um, in my group, we're actually doing work um, in lung cancer and in glioblastomas right now. And in these models, th this graph looks extremely promising. Next slide. So obviously all this research involves a team and I'm very blessed with the team that I work with. So my laboratory is co-run by my partner, Daniel pomeranz Um, I have an instructor in the group, the Banjan Patacharya. Laura Calais has been my trusted lab manager for many, many years. And she and I postdoc together at Hopkins many years ago. Vaibhav Gawali is an electrophysiologist in my group um, who's great. Camden Danashan is um, a very good immunologist and a lung cancer, um, lung, lung cancer specialized postdoc. Aniradha Karve is a PhD student that I co-mentor with the chair of pharmacy, um, Professor Desai, and he's doing the GBM project under my supervision. Jim Cook is the synthesizer of the newer class of benzodiazepines. Jeannie Kowalski, Mary Matvedevic helped with all of these sequence heat maps. Ben Izar is a melanoma collaborator of mine at Columbia, Mohammed at Emory. Andy Jenkins is an electrophysiologist I've worked with at Emory and he and I collaborate still. And Pankaj Desai and Shayan Shi are collaborators of mine at Cincinnati. Um, next slide. So some questions members of my group ask is that can a benzodiazepine be effective as a part of an anti-cancer regimen? And yes, uh, the answer is yes, actually. So for radiation, a lot of my colleagues uh, will dose their patients with um, a low dose of lorazepam so that they don't get anxious with the mask um, and, um, and with the radiation treatments. So instead of using a non-specific benzodiazepine, if we use this newer class of compounds, not only would it enhance the radiation, it would also help if immunotherapy was being used with radiation. And if it's part of a regimen with radiation, it wouldn't be used constantly. And so the issues of habit forming properties of the benzodiazepines would not come into it. Is there more to how benzodiazepines work? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, GABA receptors are not only in the cancer cells. There's probably a crosstalk occurring with immune cells and the tumor microenvironment because GABA is an incredibly important part of metabolism in a cell. So um, the way that these cells are crosstalking are um, a project that's going on in my lab with um, Dr. Gawali, who's the electrophysiologist. He also has a lot of immune oncology experience. And so he's looking at how T cells work in these tumors. Are we missing a lot buried in clinical data that could provide insight into possible repurposing of drugs? Absolutely. I've just touched on the tip of the iceberg. I think there are a lot of drugs out there that could have um, a lot of important effects. And um, we're just beginning to scratch the surface and I'm not the only one, there are many of us who work on repurposing of um, compounds in various cancers and diseases. Are GABA receptor neurotransmitters contributing to cancer cell development and growth? Probably, um, and that's something, again, we're looking at to see whether we can play around with the properties of the neurotransmitter to change the way the cancer cell grows. Um, Debanjan Patacharya in my group is trying to create a transgenic mouse model to look at this. Next slide. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Give me one second. Thank you so much, Soma. In a real world, of course, we would now applause. There would now be applause. So I hope you know you can all do a, a silent applause at home, please. Um, that was absolutely fascinating talk. I love all this sort of repositioning and repurposing of, of drugs. Um, let me just pull up the chat and um, see if we've got any talks uh, questions coming in. And if not, I can. I mean, I can start by asking. I mean, are 
are the um are these drugs currently licensed for use or is this still on a um purely uh, experimental basis for use sorry as anti-cancer agents or as part of cancer therapy so the answer is no the um, current class of um, the newer benzodiazepine uh, by benzodiazepines are not licensed for use and we formulated them. So we do have a formulation available and um, we are sort of looking into getting an exploratory IND so that we can start using them in a preclinical clinical setting. Thank you. We might come back to that, but we've got a question here. Um, when treating the mouse melanoma model with benzo, can the treatment be extended in, in cases of months, I'm guessing not with the model, but in that case, what happens to melanoma tumors, slower growth, static or shrinking? So can you slow that process down? Yeah, so basically they shrink completely. So you can't detect them by imaging anymore. And if we didn't sacrifice the mice, they're actually pretty happy for their lifespan. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, and um, here we have what I call IACOC protocols. So we're actually obligated after a period of time to um, call them. So, yeah. Yeah, these things are set, aren't they? Can I ask, um, well, we've, well, I'm just waiting for um, people to think of some questions. Um, with repurposing and repositioning of drugs, obviously this is, it's a, it's a marvelous thing because the drugs are already, tested for safety and some of the, the other sort of aspects. And I'm guessing, although I don't know much about this, that then you get a shortened time of reuse of that drug. Presumably you get to, when I asked the question about licensing, presumably actually getting to um, use the drug is, is quicker. Is that, is that correct? Am I, um, so yeah. The the, yeah, so um, the, the way that the FDA works, um, it would actually require a complete, uh, complete rechecking, even though it's very similar in structure to mm -hmm. value. Um, but if you have orphan diseases, so for example, medulloblastoma, glioblastoma, yes, you can kind of um, move things along much faster. And what we're trying to do um, in my group is to find evidence for more than one cancer type so that we can then develop it for a number of things. And I just like checking and rechecking the information to be really sure that that's what we're seeing. Because when we initially saw this in melanoma, I can tell you that wasn't a single experiment. Those were multiple mouse <laughs> experiments because it was quite yeah. a striking response. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, so, so another question that occurred to me, um, and I don't, I, I just, this is not my field, I'm a virologist, what can I say? Um, but when you were talking about using um, the benzos alongside immunotherapy and radiation, and you, and you did say um, because tumours can develop resistance, is that, is that why you go for that multiple approach to, in order to sort of hit it from as many different angles as possible? Absolutely. That, that would be um, hitting it from um, different angles. And then the other thing is um, lowering the doses of the radiation. So you're less likely to have secondary cancers yeah. and lowering the dose of immunotherapy. So from your expertise, um, Jane, you know, if you're not um, overstimulating the immune system by sort of um, drowning it with the immunotherapies, it's actually better. Less would be more in this case with this drug. Yeah, as, as we're all learning at the moment as well. But yeah, absolutely. Um, have we got any other questions from the audience? You can, if you wish, you know, unmute and ask questions or just pop them in the chat. I'm never sure what's easier for people. Hang on, there's one here, which I've missed. Um, this was a continuation, actually. Is expression of um, GABRA receptors on cells that do not belong to the nervous system a normal situation? Or is it a link to the malignancy? Um, what would be the role of the receptors on cells other than the nervous system cells? So um, I think this is where the tumor microenvironment uh, plays into it. So for example, if you think of the solid organs expressing these, and the thing is, even in the brain when they're expressed, 
it's not the same pattern that you would see in that area of the brain. So there, there are a different subset that are uh, more primitive than the standard receptor that you would see. Um, and so uh, because GABA is important um, in metabolism, I think that what's happening is that the tumor microenvironment is requiring ways to sort of propagate and they express these receptors. And um, the chloride function of this is actually also very important. Yeah, okay. Um, can I ask a question? So with, I mean, you've got a large group there and are you looking at other um, potential drugs, for, you know, the repurposed drugs for other areas, other cancers, um, other systems? Yeah, so we have a lung cancer project um, that's, uh, that's uh, ongoing and we have a glioblastoma project um, and we're looking at um, similar compounds in that. And we're also doing something where we're looking at the compound as an image tracer. So we've um, uh, reformatted it with um, different molecule, uh, molecular structure to see if we can use it in imaging because then it would light up instead of FTG PET, you would have this um, kind of trace of light up in um, malignancy. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, so another question here, would the GABA antagonist, sorry, not antagonist, agonist, whoops, induce opposite effects on mitochondria in lymphocytes compared to melanoma cells related to different directions of channel activity? So in lymphocytes, um, the receptor acts like the adult receptor. So it doesn't do the same as in um, the sort of cancer cell, which is acting like the embryonic receptor. So it's kind of a different functional variance, which is intriguing because, you know, yeah. it's amazing that the cancer cells go back to a, a developmental variant. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's another question. Is gene activation for GABA receptor expression in both nervous and cancer cells the same? Hmm, I think that's touching on that. Yeah, so the answer is um, the gene um, activation is the same, but the way they behave is different. So in other words, in an embryo, um, you're developing an excitatory neurotransmitter receptor. And in a normal cell, it's an inhibitory um, neurotransmitter receptor. So the expression, um, th th even though it's turned on and um, you get the protein made, it's behaving differently. And if we, and the million dollar question, which no one's asked, and I've been asking myself is, why? And um, because, uh, you know, is it because of early on in stem cell development, something is happening. And so we're kind of looking to see, we're actually ask, asking and trying to um, evaluate those questions in our group. Mm. And have you worked with benzos and stem cells? See what um, yes, we have. And um, we had just started doing that work. Um, and we're using sort of, we're trying to see what it's doing and it's too early to be sure. It's something that we've started to look at, sort of more of a magnetic side. There's a question here and I'm not totally sure what they're asking. Um, so it just says a comment on the role of this GABRA receptors on immune cells. I think that's what you were sort of touching on, wasn't it? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So in the immune cells, um, what they appear to do is um, from what we've done so far when we've done electrophysiology on them, it tends to stimulate them to sort of um, function more efficiently. So they, it's, uh, but it, it still is an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the immune system. So it's not something that it's, it's keeping the immune cells in check, if you like. Yeah. Huh. 
any other questions either via the blue hand thing or the i don't mind or the hand the yellow hand thing in your square or the chat we can manage all of them because i'm sure ella is is very efficient is also keeping an eye open for me um if not i think we've probably we've probably asked you enough questions soma oh it's a pleasure oh, oh there's one there's one more i think Okay, um, different different um, member of the audience as well. So what do you feel are likely to be the most important next lines of inquiry as a result of the research so far? Um, basically to see whether we can apply it to different cancers and how it works. So one of the things I haven't touched on is, okay, so it's working on this channel, but could it be working on other things? Could it, by the way that it's changing the chloride balance, be indirectly working on other proteins that are nearby? So we're looking at those effects as well. So basically, um, it's really trying to detail how it's working. We know it's uh, the GABA receptor is one of the targets, but what is, are the other things? what might be the off-target effects and are those off-target effects um, beneficial or detrimental? So those are the questions that I'm asking as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, Ella, that's probably just about perfect timing-wise, as I would expect from you, Soma. <laughs> and Thank you. I, <laughs> And I'm sure people can, um, well, you can use various ways of clapping or you can unmute yourselves and, and have a good clap. I think just thank you from all of us here for a really interesting talk. I think this is such an important area and, um, you know, good luck with this research going forward. And I'm sure you'll keep us informed and, and up to date with all that's happening. Soma is a bi fellow and will be talking and working with us with our with our medical students which is absolutely fantastic thank you very very much um, for the invitation <laughs> everybody i look forward to my um interactions and um uh you know and the other thing is if people do have questions um they could um let ella know and those could be forwarded to me okay thank you thank you, thank you very very much Thank Bye -bye. you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.